find their way into Museo's chapel. So it's a pleasure to welcome you to join us today. Uh, we're very glad to have uh, Dr. Gorlinda Perk is our uh, lecturer this afternoon, who will speak to us um, about uh, Julian of Norwich. Um, she is a Fulford Junior Research Fellow at Somerville College here in Oxford, and also uh, um, Marie, I'm not going to make, this, make a mistake here, Marie Skłodowska Curry Fellow at the Faculty of Modern and Medieval Languages. And she's currently undertaking a three-year EC-funded project called Women Making Memories, Liturgy and the Remembering of the Female Body in Medieval Holy Women's Texts. So making women making memories of the female body. The project centers on vernacular autobiographies and also on visionary texts by devout women. Uh, from medieval, northwestern Europe, and it contextualizes these works with the liturgy and the art of memory. Holinda hails from the Netherlands. Uh, her academic background is in English literature and in psychology. After her PhD at Umia University in northern Sweden, we've been talking about um, uh, the interest of living in that far north. After she completed that work in 2017, she branched out into exploring uh, the parallels between continental and English vernacular theology while she was teaching um, in Sweden. Her work considers the intersection of holy women's texts, medieval literary theory, material culture, and folklore. So one of her um, uh, 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 publications published this, this year or last year, A Not So Subtle and So Mighty, uh, on Missing Academic Thinking and Julian of Norwich. Missing Academic Thinking and Julian of Norwich reflects those uh, a combination of interests. Um, the uh, also uh, published in the last year, um, the uh, you can find uh, Colin is speaking about self-isolating uh, about, about the COVID pandemic in the Pusey House Journal, which is available on the Pusey House website, self-isolating in God, hope, and enclosure with Julian of Norwich. And she looks at the um, Anchorite uh, life as, as, as a way of helping us to think about the isolation we've endured or suffered, and some people have even enjoyed uh, during the last uh, number of months. And you can find a full list of publications on her University of Oxford site. A few things, um, uh, technical things about Zoom. You can ask questions during the lecture using the chat function, but the, the, the questions will be answered at the end. During the lecture, I invite you to turn off your camera, please. If you turn off your camera, that helps with bandwidth issues and will ensure that um, uh, we have the best possible uh, picture of um, Colinda and her PowerPoint presentation in particular. So uh, please turn off your cameras after the, uh, after the introduction. Uh, and then you're very welcome during the question and answers to turn your cameras back on. Um, once the talk starts, you'll be muted. After the talk, you will be able to unmute. If you'd like to ask questions, you can either simply uh, pitch in to ask a question or um, use the chat to, to ask questions. Um, and I will uh, I'll try to moderate that when we get up there. Linda, it's a great pleasure to have you uh, with us today, and thank you so much. Uh, I, I hand over to you now. Thank you, Father George, for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to give this lecture. Also, many thanks for Jonathan, to Jonathan to, for convening these talks, and to the chapter for the hard work on the poster. Alex, for instance, helped with the poster, and Jack for sending out the emails. And I will start sharing my screen now. Imagine you have just bought um, a new novel by your favorite author and you have been devouring this novel and you've reached the final chapter. Only, so you turn the page, only to find the author declaring, this book is not yet completed, I want you to continue writing it. 
Now, faced with such a direct request, all of us, most of us, would be rather surprised because um, modern novels rarely call upon that, that call upon their reader, readers this directly to to finish a text. However, this is exactly what 14th century what 14th century visionary and medieval theologian, vernacular theologian Julian of Norwich does in the 86th and final chapter to her text to her work, A Revelation of Love. She writes, This book is begun by God's gift and his grace, but is not yet completed, as I see it. With God working within us, let us all pray to God for charity. So despite her having reflected for 80, 85 chapters on her visions and their theological ramifications, she still feels her work to be unfinished. So, and well, um, in, in addition to this suggesting that Julian is a bit of a perfectionist, which is something who struggles to abandon things, which is something, uh, something to which the academics among us perhaps can relate, the, her request there also makes explicit her, her impulse, her urge to constantly revise, remake, recreate her text, because this quote ap appears in the second, later, in the later version of her, of her work. She has already written an earlier version several decades ago, so, which she, and it is quite likely that she spent most of her adult life re reworking her text. So despite this constant reworking, remaking, she still feels her, her text to be not yet performed, as she writes Middle English. And the point I want to make today is that is that, that impulse, that art of lifelong revision, as Barbara Newman calls it, is of theological importance, that it does theological work. So, and in doing so, I will introduce you to um, a Julian who is possible, um, who to a different side of Julian, namely a Julian who is not your grandmother's Julian of Norwich. Um, sorry, Father, Ma Father George, well, would you mind turning on your video so I can at least narrate it to you? It's a bit unsettling to be narrating this thing to myself. Okay, never mind, I will keep narrating to myself. Um, <laughs> Okay, Jack, I'll just narrate this to you. Thank you, Jack. Um, so, um, it's, easy, it's easy to have, to have someone else than, than oneself to tell it to you. To, to, so, I will introduce you to a lesser known side of Julian. So, a Julian who's not your grandmother's Julian of Norwich. So, because Julian is sometimes pictured as... Um, a serene figure, a, a nice little old lady who sat in a, who was who was sat in a room and came up with these devout three avarisms, these truisms, such as sin is behoven and all shall be well, and that was a glass. Um, never mind. Um, yes. Apologies. Never mind. Yes. So I will continue talking. Um, yes. So, rather, Julian, I will introduce you to Julian, who is, as Barbara Newman calls her, a stubborn intellectual, because these, um, she and someone who experiences more, um, more, in more intellectual struggles and more em um, also emotional distress than those sound bites would have you um, would would have you believe. So. Um, so, because the point I also want to make today is, um, and as others also have claimed, that she's not that despite not being able, to, not having received a formal education as a theologian, she is quite an expert exegete and quite a radical theological thinker. Dennis Turner talks about her as a systematic theologian, and we can see this from how from from how she displays um, an enormous amount of confidence in her thinking processes, um, for instance. So, um, so in, in her intellectual progress and her intellectual development and how she keeps her, her thought processes on the page. So she show, instead of presenting us with a finished answer, 
she keeps her working, she shows her working, she keeps it all on the page. So as Elizabeth Dutton observes, she presents the processes of her developing understanding as the processes of, of her developing text. And I will also argue, and I will also want to uh, argue today that her theological expertise and her um, and her her theological skill and innovation is also hiding in plain sight because it, we can see it in how she revises her text. So. So that's basically the main point I want to make today, that the fact that she revises her text and how she revises her text does important theological work, that her constant revision of her text is crucial for understanding her theology. So she theologizes by rethinking her text and her theology. And how... I, so... Um, how we will approach that today, I will first introduce you to the little we know about Julian and um, tell you a bit about her day job, namely that of an anchorite. Um, I will also describe her two texts and how they relate to one another. And then I will, um, then we turn to two case studies of these revisions and their theological import. And, and by way of conclusion, I will, um, we, I will explore what the fact that she revises at, uh, does, so what, what the general importance of that is, but also show how Julian ultimately moved beyond the oppositions that these revisions pose. And then I look forward to hearing your questions. And I, um, I've asked you to bring um, some props. And um, would you mind, for those of you who switch, would you mind holding up the prop so I can see what? Um, so I've asked you to bring a cloth handkerchief and or a cloth napkin and a regular sized marble. I've asked you to do so because a zoom lecture can be a bit um, can, can be can feel can feel can, um, sometimes can feel um, feel a little um, passive and like there's no sense of dialogue there. And also because um, Julian's text, while it is on the one hand quite ex for for those who encountered for the first time, it feels very accessible. So it's very, quite grounded on the one hand. On the other hand, it can also be quite abstract. So um, manipulating something tangible will really um, help feel what she's trying to accomplish. What is more, it will also allow us to, to really room, to really ruminate uh, on her work, to really to really get a sense of how to inhabit her, her words. So and um, so, I've asked you to bring a regular sized marble because a marble is roughly the size of the hazelnut sized sphere that she sees in one of her visions. So as you can see here, hazelnut, um, marble, hazelnut. However, for the, um, for the sake of visibility, I've I have brought this very large marble so that you can see what I'm doing and hopefully join in, which um, I do recommend. But you can put aside the ha the handkerchief and the marble for now. And to begin with a few things about historical Julian. Well, one of the first things to note is that she's the earliest English woman writer. There have been, there may, there, it is very likely that there were others before her, but she is the earliest one that we know of, whose name has come down to us, which is why she is, as Evelyn Underhill calls her, the earliest English, the first English woman of letters. And to turn to who she was, um, who she was as a person, who, um, who this historical Julian was. Well, unfortunately, the biographical data is very scant. We only have the things, uh, the only the only information provided is that which she provides in her book and some wills bequeathing money to her. On the basis of that, it has been suggested that she was a nun before she became an anchorite. That is the traditional hypothesis. Uh, in which case she would have been a nun at Carrow. 
Another more recent hypothesis is that she was a wife and mother before she um, became an anchorite, uh, possibly because she was a widow at that time. And if she, ha if that was the case, as some people um, speculate, she may have lost her husband and perhaps one or two children during the bubonic plague, because she lived through through three outbreaks of the bubonic plague: one in 1349, one in 1361, and 1369. So, if there's quite an um, uh, both vision and revelation do pay a lot of uh, do thematize uh, suffering, and so. That the, the, the bubonic plague is one backdrop against which, which um, that sense of questing, um, because that sense of generally of being generally upset and really um, of sense of loss and being utterly lost. That that um, when she talks about suffering of being ge of generally struggling to understand um, how. And suffering could have been permitted, so that is one backdrop against which um, revelation. Ca so the bubonic plague is one, uh, but also of course other disasters would happen during that time, is one backdrop against which revelation and vision can be read. So for those of you unfamiliar with her work, her, both of her texts, so which can actually be seen as one work, center on. A, a series of visions that she that she ha experienced at 30, at the age of thirty and a half when she was seriously ill and believed to be on her deathbed. So, her book describes how she is how she is, how she believes that she is on the, on the verge of dying, and at that point, she 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 experiences she experiences several visions, and these visions consist of very brief puzzling images which are unlike anything by her contemporaries, say Bridget, St. Bridget of Sweden, because these images are almost cinematic in their visual quality. They are very, um, they're quite paradoxical. So um, it, it all starts with her seeing Christ's head bleeding copiously, and then it segues into those, those famous images, for instance, of the hazelnut, um, the hazelnut-like -like thing lying in the palm of her hand, and she's told that this is all that is made. She also sees God in a point, so you can see that these images are quite um, quite puzzling and something to really, that, that generally demand unpacking. What is more, she also hears Christ make quite terse, nomic statements, for instance, those very brief lines, um, for instance, that famed, all shall, sin is, sin is necessary. But all shall be well. Which again also uh, quite differs from anything her contemporaries may have um, recount. For instance, in Bridget of Sweden, the saints are always nattering on. Um, so, um, and what her work also consists of is that she then begins to re reflect at length and really um, um, unpack, expand upon these visions by um, so um, she by th reflecting upon their theological implications and on the basis of that, particularly in Revelation, she develops quite her, um, her own her own perspective on various contemporary theological issues. Um, And um, so, let's see, well, where was I? So it forms a springboard for her own theological reflection, the, 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 those visions. And particularly in a later text, the genre really shifts from only an account of her visions to more of a spec work of speculative theology. What, um, returning to historical Julian once more, what we do know with quite with quite some certainty because we have wills, that she became an anchorite before sometime before 1393. And here you can see a re reconstruction of her cell um, at St. Julian's in Norwich. And here in the blue circle you can see her cell, but it's a reconstruction, so the windows may have been uh, quite quite 
a bit, may have been smaller and the and the building behind it that's the uh, that's the church so the next question is of course what is an anchorite so an anchorite is an individual who has withdrawn from the world to live walled in um, confined in a room which was attached to a church or, or within a church. So the word enkwai derives from the Greek word for, for to withdraw or to retire. And they would, live there, they would live there for the rest of their lives. So you could consider them to be professional self-isolators. And this was an independent uh, religious vocation. So unlike uh, monks and nuns, they were not under the authority of an abbess or, an, or um, so unlike none, they were not under the authority of an abbess, so, um, um, or any other kind of um, figure running up. So, yes, so, 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 but they, instead they were directly under the authority of a bishop. And, however, like, like monks and nuns, they did spend their days praying various forms of the divine office, such as the little hours of Our Lady and, um, uh, the hours of, of of the Holy Ghost, but they were also expected to to provide spiritual counsel to their communities. As a result of which, they could become quite popular, beloved spiritual advisors to the people in their in their towns, in their communities. So yeah, I will put aside the props so that, so that there isn't any noise. So to turn to her works, two texts have come down to us, um, which ascribe themselves to her, and it is important to keep in mind here that the titles are editorial inventions, they are imposed by the editors because most medieval books do not have titles in the way that modern books do. So there's a, sh there's a, sh a shorter text, called, um, which is sometimes referred to as a vision show to devout woman, or also called the short text, which Julian may have written before she became an anchorite. And then there's a longer text, um, which is sometimes referred to as a revelation of love, also called the long text, which Julian may may have start may may um, may have started what Julian may have started writing that text sometime. Um, sometime late in the 1390s and finished it so, and it may have been finished sometime likely of course um it was some, finished sometime before her death so um and the and one point which is important to keep in mind here as well is that Re revelation incorporates the whole of vision but it adds um but Julian, Julian adds several new visions, which he claims were part of the original visionary experience, as well as some she had late, some she had she had received later, and extend and uh, new reflections, new insights. So revelation is a wholly wholly expanded, wholly revised vision. So of course, then the question is: Are there one text or two? I think she sees them as one, um, as one work. But in addition to these changes in content, there's also quite a different. There's also a diff, there's also a change in tone and in audience because Julian becomes um, now addresses what she calls her even Christian, her fellow Christian, rather than um, ra um, rather than a, a select group of contemplatives as she does in Vision, and there's also. Um, less of uh, less anxiety about the orthodoxy of her text, though she does still hedge a lot. So, um, so there's a, a real sense of an impulse to revise and remake. Yet, we see the same impulse to revise within Revelation as we can discern between vision and Revelation. So despite her reworking her text into an, a whole new thing, she still continues rethinking, remaking, reseeing her visions and re rewriting her work, as it were, which is why some critics postulate there may have been intermediate versions.
So, and one way to um, one way to approach that and to look at the importance of her visions is to see them, um, to read them through the prism of a concept outlined by six and early 6th century mystical theologian um, and early 6th century theologian who's best known as the pseudo Dionysius because um, our, because Julian if, if we look at it that way we see that Julian um, remakes her text um, that, that, Jul that Julian's remaking serves as um, her serves as um, a dissim dissimilar similitude of the actions she claims God is performing or will perform. So differently put, in her vision she claims God is performing certain actions and will be and will perform certain actions as well. And she sees herself, she sees her actions as a dissimilar similitude of those actions. Now, what are dissimilar similitudes? So those are paradox outlined by, as mentioned, the pseudo Dionysius, and a, a, a dissimilar similitude is an image, or a simile, or a description which is, seem, which is seemingly inappropriate when when it is applied to God, but because of that, but because it is incongruous, because it is surprising or odd. It compels us to look beyond the image and see how God is uh, is unlike all unlike any image we could apply we could apply to him any image we could com anything we could compare him to him or, um, so um, and the the example given by the pseudo Dionysius is that of worm because he he claims it's more appropriate to talk about God as a worm than a, say than when about say as a lion. Because um, when you talk about God as a lion, you may be, you, uh, your mind might get stuck on that particular image. Um, is, it, so, oh yes, God is lion-like. But um, whereas if you talk about him as a worm, you see how God is unlike anything in creation. So as the pseudo Dionysius writes, by describing these heavenly ranks with the similar shapes so completely at variance, with what they really are, we come to discover how those ranks so far removed from us transcend all materiality. So the mind, as he writes, is provoked to get behind the material show. Um, another image, uh, another example which could be given is that of the Eucharistic of, of the of the of the Eucharistic wine, which is which can, um, Sometimes is white rather than red because if it is red, then you might you may go, oh, it's 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 red wine. It's like blood. Whereas if it is um, when 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 white wine is used, the mind is kind of is provoked to to look beyond that kind of idea of of similitude, but instead look at the mystery behind it and the kind of sense of um, sacramental transformation. And in the, here's a fascinating image from the Rothschild Canticles of such going behind the material show because here you can see the Trinity vanishing behind a real God the Father, God the Son and the Holy Spirit. So to move on to, um, and to Julian's text, so what, what um, I would argue that particularly Revelation displays quite a concern with how Julian's making is and remaking is both like and unlike God's making, but how his how his actions ultimately surpass her. Because at one point she talks about the creation of the human soul and the human body, and she describes God as creating the human body out of matter, out of mud, as she says. So as you can see here, um, she talks about um, God making the human body out of a matter mixed and gathered, and then a few lines later she talks about her own subject, her own text as being composed of matter, as well. Yet, she all in that same description she also claims that God made the human soul out of nothing. So ultimately, his making, his creation, 
surpasses that surpasses hers. Now let's move on to the case study, and I will need to um, show my own screen again so I can ship. Apologies. Look. So to turn to the first case study, so um, we see that she engages in um, that um, some or sometimes her remaking is quite a laborious, painful process, and it is at that occasion, it is at, it is at those occasions that it serves as a dissimilar similitude of God's making or well, as she calls it, at the end of time. Because one thing she does is that she creates all these opportunities for re-seeing her visions and for revising her text. And that both sparks and and that it both it but that both sparks and is sparked by um particular spiritual and emotional struggles she both Julian at the time of the visions experiences and both at the moment of writing. For instance, so I, um, I've already mentioned that famous soundbite, but that famous quote, those off-sided words, all shall be well. Actually, um, I, uh, I, 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 I stated by Christ uh, when she asked why sin was ever permitted to enter creation. So she asked why sin was ever, permit, was ever permitted to enter creation. And for her sin, for her and for Christ in the visions, sin encompasses all that is not well. So, and then she's told those famous lines. Sin is befitting, but all things must inevitably come to good, as it is sometimes translated. And yet, despite those rather reassur seemingly reassuring words, or perhaps... Um, she she digs in her feet. She resists, and and this is also the moment where you can see her experiencing both um, doubts, so an intellectual process of intellectual um, struggle and labor, but also it being emotionally upset. So she responds by contemplating this generally sorrowfully and mournfully. And we see a similar anxiety, a similar questing and searching in Julian Horoy's divisions because she keeps returning to these lines. And as a result of, of her questions and her uh, being stubborn, we see that we see this particular dialogue between her and her and God. And in that dialogue, at one point. Christ mentions five promises, and she then reflects upon these upon these promises and kind of glosses them and impacts them. So the, so um, and in vision she only reflects upon these. She only uh, reiterates them, impacts them, and and that is that is the only thing she does in vision. So um, and in these. Same five saying mentions previously. I may make all things well, etc. So she just um, she just ponders the she just ponders these words. Now in Revelation, something entirely different ha different happens. And I have marked here the original the um, the words from Vision, which she then includes. So in Vision, this uh, in Revelation, this the that that those promises generate a whole new chapter but because in in the because it also generates a, a, a new vision or at least one that which she claims was in the visionary experience which she um, originally had so di here we here we um, here we come to the um, dissimilar similitude because what she does is that she takes those five words, and here I will try to switch on my camera again because I've accidentally um, hit myself. So, 
So, and I will stop sh sharing for a bit because we need to do the, we need to use the handkerchief. Jack, I think my video stopped working. Yeah, I'll see what I can do, Belinda. Thank you. It seems to be a problem that you're in good length, I'm afraid. Okay, yes, I will. Uh, apologies. Uh, it says um, you cannot use your video because this thing has. Um, because the host has stopped it. Um, right. Try again. Yep, now it's working. Thank you. Excellent. Wonderful. So yes, so to continue. Um, so I'd like you at this point to take your handkerchief and fold it up um, as does. So fold it up inwards five times. And then hold it up like this. With the top facing you, so lot as this. So these are those five promises that she's heard, and these are those two lines in visions. So what she does, she she expands them into one into one chapter and one new vision, so as thus. So you can drop it. Mm. Wonderful. So she remakes her text because in and you can put aside your handkerchief. So in in expanding in remake, uh, she remakes her text because in this new chapter, that um, but by, by way of this new chapter, she in she interpolates a new action into the plot of that she envisioned the plot of salvation history, and um, this new vision in turn generates new doubts in Julian who sees the visions. So the whole, the entirety of the text is remade. What is more, in a sense, she's also making well because young Julian seeing the visions is quite a, is is in doubt. It wants to know how all, how all of this works. So in a sense, um, but she is also making well. And if we then turn to, um, and in that sense, I would argue it serves as a dissimilar similitude of the remaking that she claims God will perform because in that in that new vision um, in that new and in the new chapter she claims God will perform a miraculous action at the end of time by which all will be made well by which all shall be restored so she makes well her text she remakes her text she um, out of something namely text matter as she calls it Whereas God uh, remakes all, um, 
remakes and makes well all that is not and here and and here Julian and here this might be a bit a bit complex a bit challenging but Julian um, drawing on Saint Augustine can understands evil as a deprivation of good a non thing uh, something that lacks being so where a Julian makes something out of something God makes something out of nothing out of all that is not so um. And whereas her action her, her, is imaginable, it is something that can be, be beheld, as she calls it, something we can hold in our mind. God's action is beyond imagining, and we can see that where, 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 where she writes that Christ states, declares, it's, um, what is impossible to you is not impossible to me. So, and whereas her action is clearly situated in time, because she keeps referring to, um, to, um, 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 to, to, um, to, to the moment that this vision takes place, God's action marks the end of time. So, uh, on the last day, um, in the, uh, etc. So, there's, so, and, but I also think her, her, her struggle, her suffering there is important because that ties you to the passions. Um, so we, as a result of which um, God's cr cr um, God, God creating everything, the passion, and God's remaking everything at the end of time for her all form part of the same impulse on, on, God's, uh, on God's behalf to remake all of creation, to make all creation. So, um, and so this similar similitude suggests that she both participates in God's remaking, but, is, but that her remaking is also a mere foreshadowing, a mere shadow of it. And in that, um, we see a theological development in, for instance, um, in Vision, she talks already about God as the ultimate agent behind all things, but in, and as prayer making us aware of that, but in the Revelation this becomes a conviction that by prayer we partake in God's providential actions. However, not, not all of Julian's um, revisions are that, she, are, um, pose her, that um, cause her so much um, stress and um, emotional worries and distress. We also find her doing something slightly more, slightly more playful because she loves her images of enveloping and wrapping. And here, um, this, uh, these images of wrapping serve as a dissimilar similitude of the way she claims Christ holds together um, the human soul. So, um, and this is the second case study. And we now turn to that famous image of the hazelnut. And this is one of her earlier visions. Um, so, and because what we see here is what Gillespie and Ross in various articles call her word knot, what she will typically do, they write, what, what, is that she will take a particular nu nucleus, a particular s core of a word, and then wrap it in, in homonyms, in near rhymes, in slant rhymes, which constitute as they, as they, argue the genetic code of her theology end of quote um, so and we can see such a word knot in her famous image of the hazelnut and in this he, he showed a little thing the quantity of a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand as it seemed to me and it was as round as any ball I looked thereon with the eye of my understanding and I thought, what may this be? And it was answered generally thus, it is all that is made. And what I'd now like you to do is to take your hazelnut, your marble hazelnut, and as I, um, so to see what Julian is do doing, so, um, and so what she then, uh, she will then go on to describe Mary as God's handmaiden, which is a homonym or a homophone, and she then talks about God be, being born of her that was made. So if you would now like to make a big knot around your marble. So, 
so what she, and then she also um, refer, um, men, referred to matter, matter, uh, matter at certain points. So what she does is that she wraps words in other words. And you can put aside, put aside your hit, um, the marble once again. Because um, she will refer to these words over and over again and they accumulate, um, they, they accumulate multiple significances as a result. And here you can see a similar knotting, a similar knot, a similar image of wrapping in the Rothschild canticles where the Trinity is also being wrapped in a knot. Another wrapping, for another kind of form of wrapping which you see in the form of her text are her cross references. And the, the word knots increase in Revelation and the same goes for the cross references which are actually um, unique to Revelation. So, and because at one point um, she um, she meditates at length upon the image of Christ as a mother, and she is quite passionate about this theme. And she, as she develops this theme, she starts to see all these links to her earlier visions, and she will then cross reference them. Cross -reference them. So she will then add these cross references. So, um, and the interesting thing is that meditation appears between the 15th revelation, as she calls it. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, apologies, I will go back. Sorry, I will go back. Thank you, good Yes. So, to start once again. So, if, um, so I will start do the bit about the hazelnut once again. So, if you, if you can take your hazelnut once again and I will, um, so she talks and then wrap it again once again. So she talks about God, as she talks about God as being born of her that was made, and about Mary as God's handmaiden. So she will wrap words in words. Because, um, and here's another lovely here's an Im, another lovely image from the Rothschild Canticles, um, in which she. Um, in which we can also see the Trinity being enveloped in this particular kind of knot. But this is not the only form of wrapping which she performs, because um, these word knots increase in Revelation, but um, these cross references are unique to Revelation. What she, uh, so she has meditated length upon the um, the, the theme of Christ as a mother, and she sees all these links to the, the vision she has already seen. And and the interesting thing is, this particular uh, description and that that lengthy meditation, which occup which occupies several chapters, um, um, uh, follows the fifteenth revelation, as she calls it. So. Um, so by referring, she will refer back to an earlier revelation and already refer forward. So she can so um, so she she notices various links between this theme which she which she's discussing and things and things she has not yet discussed. So she writes, "Our Saviour is our true Mother, in whom we are endlessly born, and out of whom we shall never come to." Uh, come to birth, and I would like you to take your marble hazel marble once again, and then this is the tricky bit. Um, take the handkerchief, so and it is spoken of in the first revelation, where it says we are enclosed in Him. So she will send us back to the first revelation, and then she and then she writes. And he is enclosed in us, and that is spoken of in the 16th revelation, where it says he sits in our soul. So, you, so she, sends us, she sends us forward to the 16th revelation, which she has not yet told, so, which is also the last one. So she first sends us to the beginning, and then, and then forward all the way to, 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 the, to the, 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 her final revelation. So what she, so what she does is... Um, 
she wraps the readers in she wraps readers in her in her text. So this is the reader, and this is the text. And what is and so she, how, so what is interesting is that she both describes wrappings, and fashions them and, and creates them, because the, uh, the vision she refers to the, she refers us back to is the one in which. Um, in which God encloses humanity, wrap, uh, envelops us as if he were our clothing. And she, she, she says, he's our clothing that winds itself around us. And the same appears in the other one, in the 16th one. So an, a different image appears in the 16th one. So for her, this is God and this is us. And this is us and this is God. So this is this theme of what has what is sometimes called mutual indwelling, God dwelling in humanity, and humanity dwelling in God. And now you can um, put 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 down your lay side the the hazelnut once again. And here you can see a similar wrapping in the Rothschild Canticles. Now how so? But all of this then is a similitude rather than a dissimilitude. It, it, um, because she is doing something that she claims God is doing. So how um, how is this a dissimilar similitude? Well, um, she then go a after these meditations. She then goes on to develop this idea of God dwelling in humanity, and humanity dwelling in God in quite a idiosyncratic manner. That rather di in which she kind of. Her, you, her terminology rather diverges from what other people, her contemporaries, are doing because she then creates this rather um, a quite, quite a complex model of the human soul. She says the human soul is, co um, is composed of two parts, the substance, which, um, which some people have translated essence, or the eternal being of humankind, and the sensuality, or sensory being, or um, I think the closest, and the closest uh, analogy in our term, in our um, in today's parlance would be embodied consciousness. And so she claims um, that this substance dwells in God, and I, and God dwells in our sensuality, our experience, our being in time. And in so to to to. Uh, to sh show the hazelnut what do show the big marble hazelnut once again so this is our substance and this is god and this is our sensuality and this is god so and and she uh, she posits that christ holds together those two parts of the human soul he is the knot as she calls it who holds together those two parts and and he um, he became this knot in the uh, in, in becoming incarnate in the incarnation, which she believes to to be a kind of event that took place beyond uh, outside of time before before creation. And here's a nice visualization, which actually has not is not about that at all, but in which Christ, as it were, holds together the knot of humanity in God and God in humanity so she claims that but it is by way of that knot that humanity that we are perceived as sinless by god and that it is by by being that knot that christ saves humanity and that he leads them in their d daily being in time but also that he restores them by way of that being in time and so these images of wrapping, these, accum these accumulating images of wrapping, these wrapping around wrapping, this enveloping of, um, of various forms of enveloping, serve as a dissimilar similitude of that knot she, she, she claims Christ constitutes. And where do we see that? Well, um, and how is that a dissimilar similitude? Well, according to Julian, um, that Christ, that that knot that Christ, that Christ forms is beginningless because it was created before the beginning of time, and we see that in um, in the, in the, the quote we've already shown, where um, 
she talks about humanity being endlessly born and always and never and never and never emerging from from Christ from God. Be and here it's important. So there's the endlessness, the, the beginninglessness. What is more, it is also um, so for Julian. For Julian's remaking is of course a process. She has to start somewhere. You know that it's it, it changes. Where she claims there's no such process in God. What is more, um, and it, um, and as Barbara Newman says here, she fashions theology out of, um, out of a sem out of an out of a semantic ambiguity, or actually out of pol polysemy. She says that humanity is endlessly born and never shall come out of him. And born here has multiple meanings. It both means being born from, so in a sense being unwrapped, being um, coming, f uh, kind of being poured forth and uh, carried within. So in a sense it's not an unwrapping. So um, God both contains and gives birth to humanity, where Julian can only contain us. So God both wraps and in a sense does not wrap at all, where Julian can only wrap us in um, the handkerchief of her text. So to move on to a few preliminary conclusions, what I um, Julian see, um, so these revision of course create a sense of contingency, of, but Julian harnesses that sense of contingency to instead uh, provoke us to think about God's impassibility, the fact that he doesn't change. Be because she is constantly remaking her text, but there's no um, and God and according to her we are constantly being remade by God, yet there's no such transformation in Him as but as um, so. So by constantly beginning again, by constantly, in a sense, starting again to to re to at the beginning of her visions and constantly returning to either the beginning or the end, she emphasizes that there's no such beginning again in God. She writes, "God never began to love us." So that so her beginningless her her remaking is in a sense. Her constant is, in a sense, an image of God's beginningless, rem of God's remaking, which, in a sense, is without beginning. What so and so they 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 form they form a dissimilar similitude as a whole. The the fact that she revises. Ultimately, however, she seems to move beyond those oppositions of likeness and unlikeness, similitude or dissimilitude, because her thought forms a kind of spiraling upwards. In her thinking, she seems to spiral upwards towards. Um, she seems to want to spiral upwards to um, to God's perspective, towards a beatific vision, if you like. Of course, you cannot accomplish that in this life, but nevertheless, there is that sense of a continuously attempt to move closer by way of revisiting what she has already seen. Yet, the, those, the, um, this, her starting points, her springboards, uh, the, the, the things she starts from, I kept on the page. So, if we then again turn to um, so while at, while as the pseudo Dionysius recommends, she does in a sense move beyond the material show. She also keeps that on the page. So so she in a sense she she moves behind the handkerchief, but also keeps it in front of us. Um, and in do in so doing, she also resolves slightly the opposition between God between. Um, like and unlike, because she said, "Well, our vision is yet unlike God, but it will be like it. In the in, um, it will be like it in the end. What is more, 
she, I, um, she also kind of challenges any kind of sense of distinction between negative theology, positive theology, God's imminence and a transcendence. I think she's ultimately not that interested in any kind of distinction between God's transcendence and, and their imminence. She's more interested in the way um, she can um, she can um, she can circle between them in order to kind of spiral upwards. And to then turn to why is the tax not, and that I think ties into why is the tax not completed yet. It is only by keeping everything on the page, by showing her working, that she can prime readers to do the same. And for her, completion of a tax consists of Christ's charity, God, as she calls it, God's love being better known. And that links back to the idea of sensuality, because according to her, Christ's love can only be experienced in our being in time, in our struggles, in his remaking of, in his remaking of the human soul as we struggle and as we fall. She, she, she's convinced there are things we can only learn by struggling and by, by doubting and by, um, um, and by being restored, being remade as we fall. So she invites readers to do a similar spiraling upwards towards God. And so um, it is something about this being in time, uh, which is necessarily an individual aspect, something we can only, um, so something only each individual can experience in their lives by changing, by loss, struggle, um, pain, which she claims um, is essential to that greater understanding that she, that she aims for. So those were, that was basically the point, uh, point uh, that those were basically the main points I wanted to make. Thank you for listening. Um, I look forward to hearing your questions.